that's one of the things I, I, I think that is, is if there's a silver lining at all that that's even to be said to come out of this is that people are realizing you have to take your security in your own hands and you're your own first responder. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to also who have reached out and said, okay, I'm going to go get, I'm going to get my first gun. I need to know what to get and where to go and what kind of training to get, which is awesome to see. And I think, what is it? It's like an 80% increase from this time last year in terms of the number of people who have purchased guns and a huge significant portion of that is women because people are watching what they're seeing on television and they're watching, you know, you can see peaceful protests during the day, but then the sun sets and you have all the skinny fat kids in there, all their black hot topic gear that come out to burn down buildings because that is protected speech, but disagreement is violence. And people see this. Joining me today is radio host, television personality, Second Amendment advocate, and author of Grace Cancelled, Dana Loesch. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Good to be with you, Dave. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right. So just to clear it up, because it's going to be weird in about 10 minutes, we taped an hour-long interview about three weeks ago in the midst right. of the corona craziness, and we were stocking some interviews just because generally things have been a little nutty and you never know when you can get people. But before we release that, I wanted to do a quick 10-minute follow-up with you that we're going to post at the top of that interview and separately as a clip, just to kind of get us up to speed on everything that's happening with George Floyd, with the protests, the riots, racism, gun rights, yeah. the whole thing. So uh, how's that for an open-ended uh, intro? Where do you want to start with all of this? Oh my gosh, where, I mean, where to, yeah, where to start? Every, it just feels like the world's on fire, kind of, it does, and, and even though it feels like there's there's a lot of discussion and a lot of people who are not listening. Everybody wants to be heard and that's fine, but I, I also feel like there's no uh, nuance and we can't have any, I, I feel like people are too afraid to have honest discussion. Honest, I mean, really, I do. I feel like people are too afraid to have an honest discussion because they don't wanna be cherry picked apart, nuance is dead, and people are gonna take the absolute worst thing possible and they are going to apply that to, and, and misinterpret anything that anyone says so they can score a point. And so real, genuine, honest conversation cannot be had. We can't, we can't even agree on what the truth is anymore. So I, I mean, I, where do we go from here? Uh, well, listen, if only two people that were perhaps talking right now had just released books that in many ways deal with all of these issues, wouldn't that maybe have perhaps possibly helped I think you are onto something, Dave. I think you're onto something. That's a really good. That's a really good observation. You're right. Okay, so let's let's start this way then. Uh, what I've seen is that it seems to me that everybody across the political spectrum, almost with no exclusions, is completely disgusted by what happened to George Floyd. They want justice to be served. They want there to be a proper investigation. All of that. Uh, yeah. And that there could have been a moment where we could have come together here. And instead, I would say bad actors, mostly Antifa, sort of uh, combined with Black Lives Matter, have, have taken advantage. And now we basically are seeing our country and, and actually all over the world, cities that are on fire. So to sort of turn this to, to your specialty, I'm noticing that even here in the People's Banana Republic of California in Los Angeles, that average people who never would have thought about having a gun are suddenly talking about getting getting guns. I have a, yeah. a couple friends that just got guns this weekend. You can't get it immediately. There's still the 10 day waiting period. Yeah. Uh, but that, that went to get guns this past weekend. Are you at least enthused that people are gonna take some of their security into their own hands? I am, especially now that we're being told that the police could be defunded or demilitarized or however they're trying to walk that back. I mean, I that's one of the things I, I, I think that is, is if there's a silver lining at all that that's even to be said to come out of this is that people are realizing you have to take your security in your own hands and you're your own first responder. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to also who have reached out and said, okay, I'm going to go get, I'm going to get my first gun. I need to know what to get and where to go and what kind of training to get, which is awesome to see. And I think, what is it? It's like an 80% increase from this time last year in terms of the number of people who have purchased guns and a huge significant portion of that is women because people are watching what they're seeing on television and they're watching, you know, you can see peaceful protests during the day, but then the sun sets and you have 
have all the skinny fat kids in there, all their black hot topic gear that come out to burn down buildings because that is protected speech, but disagreement is violence. And people see this. I mean, I've been talking to business owners, business owners who, who have, have sacrificed so much and they've been shut down for I don't know how many, like three months now. They barely made it through the pandemic lockdown. And now they have to shut down again if there's going to be riots in their area. And they don't want to have everything that they that they work for destroyed. And they're like, okay, what do I do? I need to be able to get a fire. I need to get a gun. I need to get a, what do I get, a shotgun? What do I, I've had so many people ask me this. And I'm glad to see it. I wish it wasn't under these circumstances. You know, I wish that people, even during times of total safety and security, would realize that, you know, this is this is uh, a right that everyone should be able to exercise, no matter where they are or what side of the political aisle they fall on. What, what do you make of the meme that we're sort of seeing out of the left these days that you sort of reference there, which is that words are violence, but apparently now violence isn't violence. So we're hearing this all over the place now, that violence yeah. against property is not violence. I'm pretty sure that if someone burned down your house, you might consider it a violent act. Am I crazy, Dana Loesch? No, you're not at all. And I'm pretty sure if one of the people saying that had their house affected or their business affected and burned down, they'd probably change their mind on that real quick. That is violence. That's the weird thing about it. If you have disagreed with Antifa or the far left on anything, disagreement itself is so provocative that it's tantamount to violence alone. But if you engage in the actual physical activity of violence and whether you're assaulting people or setting fire to something, that's somehow protected speech. And by justifying disagreeing speech and, and presenting it as violence, they're finding they're just now fabricating ways to justify their actual physical violence. They, they want to argue themselves a way out of it. And I that's so dangerous. I don't like speech being portrayed as violence. It's not. Physical violence is violence. Speech itself is is not violent. It's not anything but speech. So I know we talked about the the silver lining part of this that people are are thinking about their own personal security and their family security and and that's good. As a conservative, are you kind of surprised that the wake up call to this was sort of amorphous mobs coming to people's property and businesses as opposed to overreaching government, right? Because usually conservatives frame the, oh, I've got to have a gun to keep government away from my property, but this is to keep citizens. We, we thought we had police that could do that. Now we've got police kneeling in the streets. Yeah, no, I think that's a good question. I think some of it too is, I, I do think that some political parties bear some responsibility with this. So in some regard, it is a little bit government. Uh, but yeah, that not that kind of what the Second Amendment has always been for? It's that uncomfortable aspect of it that everyone whispers about while they all say that it's really just, it's only about hunting and self-defense. Yes, but also it's to keep your government in check. And that's why we're so different from every other country out there. And with this, you know, Antifa seems, with all the exposés going on about Antifa, I mean, they're they're now classified as a terror group. They're sort of, they act kind of like this militant far left arm of the Democrat party. I don't, I can't see any candidates being prevailed upon to denounce their violence. They, so for so, it seems like they just kind of pretend that they don't exist. Uh, in fact, I think some of them had said, oh no, this is just, these are just like little local groups. It's not really an organized national effort, but it, but it is, yeah, but it is. Uh, I think well, you saw you saw Keith Ellison's picture with the Antifa book from yeah. like a year ago, right? Let's not he yeah. since deleted it, but this guy was almost in charge of the DNC. He lost by a couple of votes, and he's the attorney general of what state? And You're he's and yeah of, of Minnesota. Minnesota, yeah. And he's and he supports and he supports Antifa. Look, about what I guess it was about two years ago, I uh, cut a short just commentary about Antifa violence. And this was at the height when everyone was rioting on college campuses and how dare they bring in a conservative to talk to anybody. And they were setting trash cans on fire and busting up windows. And I played footage of this video and I was condemning the violence and the far left who engaged in it and defended it turned around and said that I was calling for violence by condemning their violence because condemning their violence by itself is a provocative act. And we're, we're in an upside down world right now where, where wrong is right, right is wrong, everything is awful, cats and dogs living together. It's like that line that Bill Murray had in Ghostbusters. <laughs> Ghostbusters That's where we're yeah. at right now. <laughs> All right, so I got one more for you and then we'll play the full hour interview. Uh, for the people that are like my, my friends that I talked about this weekend who are getting guns for the first time, uh, what, what would you want them to know? What resources would you send them to? For the people that have just their whole lives have been anti-gun or never thought 
ever, ever, ever that they would have a gun in the home that are now rethinking it. What's sort of the most, uh, what's the best piece of advice you can give them as they enter into this world? They need to get something that they feel comfortable shooting first off. And it also depends on whether or not this is something that they're going to use for home defense or if they're going to go get their concealed carry license and if it's going to be something that they carry. Um, I, you, I I have a lot of different firearms for different purposes, whether it's, you know, my bedside, I hear something, you know, my alarm goes off in the middle of the night, or if I'm wearing a cocktail dress and I'm going to an evening event, you know, there's something else that, you know, it's like shoes, you know, you got to have, you got to have some variety. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I always say you can't really ever go wrong with a shotgun. You really can't. If you don't have a rifle, if you've never, if you've never shot a, a semi-automatic, if you don't have a handgun, shotguns are always, that's always like a really good first choice. And the cool thing about gun owners is that they are so incredibly helpful. Uh, good law-abiding gun owners all across the country are so eager to share with you what they have found works for them and what doesn't, what kind of training works really well. There's all kinds of, like, you know, you have the California Rifle and Pistol Association out where you are, some really awesome people that do really good training. They're like up to date with everything uh, and they have really good recommendations as well uh, as to where you can go, what ranges you can go to. I mean, we people even get it down to, you know, ammo selections for crying out loud. Uh, so there's, there's so many resources out, but I always tell people if you're not, you know, if, you, if you've never been around firearms, Shotgun's always something really good to start with. For handguns, I like to recommend like a Glock 19, which is a personal preference of mine, you know, six hour P365, uh, m and I mean, there's, there's a lot of good choices out there. And uh, a lot of these, a lot of the manufacturers out there too, these all started, you know, a lot of them are American companies, American manufactured, American jobs. And that's one of the other focuses, I think, of our issues today is keeping everything right here in the U.S. of A. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversation about the gun debate instead of nonstop yelling, check out our gun debate playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.